This is CBC Here and Now. This could be something that could really turn us around economically if it's done properly. Pot legalization, a supporter says there's huge potential for economic gains here. The House opens ahead of next week's budget with the speech from the there throne. There is a great opportunity to do better with less. Should the province invest in a controversial aquaculture project? Absolutely not. There's no way because it's a conflict of interest. And in the weather department, we are tracking a quiet Thursday and then things really ramp up through uh, Thursday, I should say, a quiet Wednesday, ramping up through Thursday into Friday. I'll get my timeline straight and I'll have your weather forecast coming up. Well, a day after CBC broke the news that the federal government hopes to legalize marijuana by Canada Day 2018, the man in charge of it all was in St. John's meeting with the Justice Minister. Yeah, Bill Blair, the former Toronto police chief, is in charge of the federal marijuana file, and he met with Andrew Parsons for a justice summit, but he was asked about the plan for legalizing pot. Yes, he confirmed that the individual provinces will have a big role to play. They'll decide where the marijuana will be sold, how much it will cost, and how old you have to be to buy it. While the federal government will be in charge of making sure the marijuana supply is safe, Blair says it will need to be a joint effort between the two levels of government. However the government of Newfoundland chooses uh, to, to manage their system. We want to make sure that, that our system of, of regulation and production and their system of regulation of retail seamlessly come together to ensure that we are able to achieve what we're setting out to achieve, do a better job protecting our kids, do a better job of making our communities safe by taking the influence of organized crime away and do a better job protecting the health of our citizens. Now this legalization will also be a new source of tax dollars in this province, but Right now, there's no rollout plan in place. No, Justice Minister Andrew Parsons says there's been a lot of talk, but no decisions have been made yet. He says they want to make sure they do it right. I've had conversations just about every, every week and every month on this, you know, within our departments, with my colleagues, with the feds. So I'm confident we're going to be able to, to handle that. I mean, it's like anything. It's, it's a big move. It's a big shift. So there is concern there because you want to do it right. And, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to do that. I think it's the will of Canadians that uh, they want to move forward in this, in this direction. I'm willing to move forward in this direction, certainly. And we'll be doing our due diligence and our work to make sure that it, it rolls out as smoothly as possible. Now, for people who use marijuana recreationally, this comes as some good news. Yes, uh, Gideon Barker supports the legalization of pot and is hoping government hits that target date of July 1st, 2018. So I'm really hoping that they follow through with this. It's good news if they do, and it means that we actually have a date to work with, that provinces can actually go back to and say that this is the date that we're going to have to have some legislation put forward. Um, but it is all yet to be seen. Uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that this is the step forward that they're going to be making, and I really hope this is the date that they actually choose. Now we also talked to Gideon Barker about the province's role in all of this and the news that households may be permitted to grow a maximum of four marijuana plants. We'll hear more from him and from Bill Blair in about 20 minutes. Well, better with less. There are familiar words in this province. And today we heard that message again as the Lieutenant Governor Frank Fagan delivered the speech from the throne in the House of Assembly. Here now is Terry Roberts was at the speech today and he joins us live from the floor of the House of Assembly with more. Terry? Yeah, Peter. Well, the Lieutenant Governor sat in that chair today and he spoke for an hour and 15 minutes, reading a speech prepared for him by the Liberal government, spelling out the next vision for the next 12 months for this government. And that vision, as we all know, is called the way forward. The Premier updated us on it yesterday, and today the Lieutenant Governor tried to put a little more meat on the bones, with the government saying it wants to create an economy that's more sustainable and versatile and diversified. Well, if you work for this government, really the big question you have is will there be massive sweeping layoffs in next week's provincial budget? That's the big question you have on your mind, and we pressed the government today, and also there were no hints of that in the, in the uh, throne speech. That did not satisfy the opposition. I don't like the signals this is sending. Uh, I think that, you know, we'll see more of, uh, you know, spe uh, spending cuts and, um, and privatization is the direction they seem to be headed in. And, uh, you know, the last year, the, the government's policies did a lot of damage to our economy, and I 
you know, we live in hope between now and next week's budget that we will see a change in direction, but I didn't see any indication of that today. So we pressed the Premier today. Give us a sign, give us a hint. Are there big sweeping cuts coming in next week's budget? The Premier refused to do so. But what he did do is defend the way forward strategy and also today's speech from the throne. What do you make of that reaction? That I mean, it was an hour and 20 minutes long and it didn't really say anything. I said, I think it said a lot. It, in matter of fact, when you look at where we were and the commitments that we've made, it's really an extension of the, of the plan that we've laid out. Budget day will lay out the financial plan for our future for the next year. Uh, today's speech from the throne did exactly that. It was a continuation of our way forward. You can, and you could expect, you know, when we put a plan in place, that we're not going to be actually uh, moving away from that just six months later. So for those looking for some signs that there are cuts coming next week, this is really the closest that the Lieutenant Governor came to telegraphing that today. There is a great opportunity to do better with less. While Newfoundland and Labrador's program costs are the highest per capita among province, many of our outcomes, including health outcomes, rank among the lowest. Put simply, we are not seeing a sufficient return on investment. Further poor outcomes drive spending higher. It is incumbent on us as a government to be sure a healthy return on investment of taxpayers' dollars. Now, now, I was told yesterday it was an emotional time here in government. Uh, many of those management jobs that were cut uh, several weeks ago, those nearly 300 management jobs, well, some of those layoffs took effect yesterday. Lots of tears, I'm told, lots of hugs as people said their final goodbyes, leaving their jobs for the last time. So will we see a repeat of that next week, uh, you know, when the budget is brought down? Will the government reach its deficit reduction targets, hundreds of millions of dollars in spending that they want to cut? Well, we'll have to wait until next Thursday, April 6th, Budget Day. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts at the House of Assembly. There are new numbers tonight about the amount of time people in this province are waiting for certain medical procedures, and it's both good and bad news depending on your problem. If you're waiting on cataract surgery or a procedure to repair a hip fracture, then the wait time is within the medically accepted uh, time frame. That's an improvement of close to 10% from five years ago. But if you need your hip or knee replaced, then the wait time is a little longer than five years ago. As for for radiation therapy, the wait time here is within the 28-day accepted time frame. The study comes from the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Well, NAEP is calling for immediate action to address, address rather the lack of available ambulances in the St. John's area. Red alerts happen when there's no Eastern Health Ambulance on standby available to answer a call. Now, that happened for a total of 7,500 minutes last year. Although that's better than the year before, the public sector union says it's still not good enough. NAEP says the province hasn't followed through on all of a consultant's reports looking for some recommendations and to add resources to the system. You would expect the recommendations to be implemented rather than sit and collect dust. This is people's lives we're talking about. This is people that were potential significant medical events that we're talking about that when they call an ambulance may not be available. Now we have reaction from Eastern Health tonight. In a statement, the health authority says some of the recommendations in that report have been put in place. It's added two new ambulances and eight new paramedics. The health authority says red alerts are down by 35% since then. A new coalition of salmon conservationists, environmentalists and scientists is urging the provincial government not to buy a stake in a massive salmon farming project proposed for Placentia Bay. The previous provincial government signed a memorandum of understanding with Grieg to buy a large stake in the company's $250 million project. Now the current government says it hasn't yet decided if it will honor that MOU. Coalition founder Leo White says the province shouldn't own part of an industry that it also regulates. Absolutely not. There's no way because it's a conflict of interest. You know, someone who's got a, a, 20, a $45 million stake in a project, that makes them a 20%, a 25% shareholder. And then to be responsible for oversight and regulation of that project at the same time, it's impossible. We've already seen the effects of the Jordan decision. Court cases are being thrown out because they've taken too long to go to trial. 
the drug case against Tony Klo and Kurt Churchill, the child luring charges against a former RCMP officer in Labrador. Well, today, key players in the provincial justice system met in St. John's to look for solutions. Here and now's Megan McCabe reports. It's rare to see all these people in one room, across from each other in a courtroom, leading someone in handcuffs, advocating for mental health. That's where they usually are. But at today's summit on the criminal justice system, they're working together to make the system better. I don't think it's just a case of throwing money at the problem. In many cases, if you want to look at changing policy and changing procedure, there's no cost to that. It's just, and that's where, again, this meeting comes down to, can we do things differently? Just because we've done things a certain way for so long doesn't mean we need to stay entrenched in that view. Parsons says they've hired three new Crown attorneys to help speed things up, and the feds say they're working to support the provinces. But we're looking at, at how we can, through legislative change, and through investment, find ways to help them become more efficient in, in the way they're doing their job. But it is absolutely essential that we work together on this. You know, there, there's an old saying, justice delayed is justice denied. And, and people have a right um, uh, to, to timely justice. And not only those who are offenders in the system, but for the victims of, of, of crime. Blair says the feds paid for a study into creating a drug court here to help take pressure off the system. But unlike the timeline for the right to a fair trial under the Jordan decision, there's no timeline for bringing in these changes. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. A mother in Labrador is fighting for the custody of her two children. She says she's overcome her addiction to alcohol and has done everything the provincial government has asked of her. But she says when she asks how to get her children back, she's told the file is closed. Here now is Jacob Barker has more. It was about two years ago that her daughter was born. It's been over a year since she's held her. It was traumatizing. Authorities took the baby the day she was discharged after giving birth. With no indication, no warning, nothing. They just come in and snatched her. Child protection laws won't allow us to identify the mom. A couple of years earlier, her son was taken. At that time, she admits it was a struggle. I was using my addictions, like just to numb my feelings, my pain. And I was just getting out of an abusive relationship at the time too. But the mother says she's been doing everything asked of her by the Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development, AA, counseling, even rejected from one parenting skills workshop because as an Eastern Health social worker put it, it would be a waste of their resources because the mother has all the skills necessary to parent the child. The mother moved back to Labrador over a year ago from St. John's. In the city, she would have conferences with the department about her progress. Back in Labrador, she hasn't had a meeting since she arrived. I don't know if it's prejudice they hold towards Native mothers. I really don't know. Like, I've done everything what they asked me to do, and I'm still not getting nowhere. Both children are with separate family members. She sees her son for a couple of weeks a year on the holidays. But her daughter That's is another story. Question. She That's says it's a struggle just to get updates like, on the girl's condition. The only time I get any information on my daughter is when I call a social worker in St. John's. I don't get to see her. I don't get to see any pictures. I don't know how she's doing. Since day one, I've found, and this is my own personal opinion, that the mother has gone above and beyond. Roy Blake with the Nunatsia government believes the mother can take care of the kids. He says she deserves answers. It's like slamming a door in your face. Maybe it's because I don't know enough about how CYFS operates, but if this is how they operate, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's very sad. The mother says she's not giving up, and the rest of this fight may be in the courtroom. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. February, a snowstorm caused the bubble to collapse here at the Greenbelt Tennis Club. It was a stressful couple of weeks, but staff have it back up, and tennis has resumed. I'm Jeremy Nob. That story coming up on Here and Now.
Time now to check in with Ryan and uh, the weather. So everyone's still, Nothing you know, waiting on. for Oh, yeah, this no, quiet. nice quiet it's day for you. Quiet. You got out for yeah. a nice coffee, you know. Long Range <laughs> looks real quiet. Uh, nothing on the menu. Yeah, Wishful just thinking. Your yeah. legs up and Obviously, uh, still uh, very much focused on the Thursday and more so Thursday night into Friday time period uh, for the island, in particular, the eastern parts of the island. Uh, we're going to dive into that, obviously, with the long range forecast. Uh, we want to get to tomorrow. Tonight and tomorrow out of the way as well. Uh, let's just show you the weather on the way headlines. And for those that do have travel plans tonight into tomorrow, uh, we have one, of course, make sure everybody's informed about the calm before the storm, though we will have some flurries in the mix. The snow will begin on Thursday across the island. It starts as flurries and light snow, and then it's really ramping up for the later parts of Thursday, Thursday night. And as I mentioned, the meat and potatoes of this system in terms of the strongest winds and the heaviest snow and mixing looking uh, possible here on the Avalon will be from the later day Thursday right through Friday and uh, then tapering off as we move into the early morning hours of Saturday. So we'll uh, again break that down in a little more detail. How about those temps today that were a little bit warmer? How about a lot of bit warmer than what they've been the last couple of days above zero today along the uh, south and west coast as expected. Uh, I'm riding the freezing mark near that northeast coast of minus four in Happy Valley Goose Bay, the high minus four in Labrador City. That's where we are right now and temperatures of uh, still hanging on to above freezing from Argentia up into Badger Stephenville at uh, three on the plus side right now. Wind chills though still a little on the brisk side for the northeast coast in St. John's minus eight to minus 10 right now is what it feels like as it does in Labrador City. Again, the winds have been strongest right along that Atlantic coastline for today and that again will continue to be the case as we move over the next uh, a few hours. Winds will continue to ease tonight as that big storm out in the Atlantic continues to move over towards the UK. The weather story really today has been this area of high pressure trying to hang on between these two systems, the one departing and this one that's been bringing some messy precip over the Maritimes, but it will sail to the south and is already starting to do so. Won't really be an impact for us other than the light flurry action and, and, and cloud cover that we're going to be seeing um, moving across the province for tomorrow. It's this system. That's rolling off the eastern seaboard and this subtropical low. Those are the two weather players as we move towards the later parts of the week. And that is what is going to be bringing the snow, the ice pellets, the freezing rain and the wind and the, quite a bit of wind on the menu again for the later parts of this week as well. So let's walk you through your timeline here. Uh, note the quiet conditions tonight. Wind still a little bit breezy along that northeast coast. We're going to be seeing the best flurry chances over western Labrador with increasing clouds and a chance of flurries across Happy Valley Goose Bay. There's an isolated risk of a flurry for most of the island through tomorrow into tomorrow morning for your uh, heading out to the bus forecast anywhere from minus three to minus nine on the island and minus 16 in the north to minus 12 in Labrador City. Now, as we roll throughout the day tomorrow, again, we are going to be seeing the cloud cover, no doubt dominating, but some breaks of sun here or there, especially along that southeast parts, uh, the southeast parts of the island. So as we roll into Wednesday evening and into the overnight, here comes our snow again, holding that's that first system that's at this point starting to merge with that subtropical low that will start to push in some snow across the island. Again, a full breakdown on that coming up in just a few minutes with your long range forecast. There are your highs tomorrow again, riding the freezing mark, northwesterly winds, uh, winds becoming light along the west coast. That'll help temperatures again up to two on the plus side there, uh, looking at minus four to minus five for inland parts of Labrador and don't go anywhere. Long range details right through the weekend coming up in just a few. Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Well, as we look ahead to the next snow, we want to take a look back at some of the damage from one of the last big storms. The burst bubble at the Greenbelt Tennis Club is back up just weeks after it collapsed. The club feared the worst when its tennis covering came down during a massive snowstorm last month. Well, a few busy weeks later and the courts have reopened. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has the story. Under the bubble, these courts see a lot of hits. But in February, during a massive storm with high winds and heavy snowfall, it was the bubble itself that took a beating. If you've seen the bubble here, it's, it's a big structure. It's about 0.8 of an acre. And all that snow and wind just blew in one direction. And uh, it accumulated, and the snow load actually tore the bubble right off the building. Much like this file footage from 2007, the giant bubble deflated. It's a very big structure and depending on how it comes down, you get varying damages. We were very lucky this time. It came down very gently. 
It's not as light as its name would lead you to believe. The weight of it crushed all the lights. The bubble is 30 years old. Greenbelt needed a specialized team to fly in from Ontario to help patch it and try to blow it back up. You have to get all the snow off it, which is a lot of snow and ice. Uh, and then at that point you wait for the weather. And what you're waiting for generally is not too much wind, no snow, a nice day. In February, hard to find. It took five weeks to inflate. That's five weeks without a place to practice for up and coming tennis players. Our high performance program is a program of about 20 kids and six are away at nationals in these next couple weeks. And we're the indoor training center for the Canada Games Center, or the Canada Games team. So that's this summer. Without this center in the province, they would have no training until June, maybe July. Staff of the Greenbelt Tennis Club are looking at some new redesigns where the bubble attaches to the buildings, ones that it hopes We'll keep the bubble standing for years to come. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, coming up after the break, a recreational marijuana user walks us through the challenges he believes Ottawa must overcome if it hopes to legalize the drug by July of next year.
Well, back now to our top story, the legalization of marijuana. The man in charge of the federal government file is former police chief and current Ontario MP Bill Blair. Now, he spoke earlier today at a, justi a criminal justice forum in St. John's. Here is part of what he had to say. Our aim is to keep this out of the hands of kids. Our aim is to, re to replace the criminal enterprise that's currently being run by organized crime in, in the production and distribution of this drug with a regulated system of production and distribution that has strict controls, oversight, measurement, testing, and accountability. And, and none of that exists in the current system. But we recognize that, that none of us acts in isolation in this. The federal government has a significant role in ensuring that there is strict regulatory control of, of the production of, of cannabis. But under our constitution, the provinces have an authority to regulate a, a retail environment. So we, we're working with the provinces. And, and it, it is a very collaborative effort. And we, we're going to have to make sure that we work well together. I think the public, and, and the public interest demands the very best of us in this. And I know that there is, there is there are people have, have, have questions. Those are important questions. We have a responsibility to, to, to ensure that every action we take is based on the evidence and the best advice of experts. I spent the last year and a half consulting with those experts and examining that evidence. We're prepared to, sh to share that with our provincial and municipal counterparts and work collaboratively together to make sure that we do the best in each part of this country. As I alluded to in my earlier remarks, there are different regional perspectives and approaches that, that may be quite appropriate in their jurisdiction. And we respect that, that the provinces have that authority. And, and so, However, the government of Newfoundland chooses uh, to, to manage their system. We want to make sure that, that our system of, of regulation of production and their system of regulation of retail seamlessly come together to ensure that we are able to achieve what we're setting out to achieve, do a better job protecting our kids, do a better job of making our communities safe by taking the influence of organized crime away, and do a better job protecting the health of our citizens. If we are together able to do all three of those things, we will serve Canadians well. Now, Blair also says that July 1st, 2018 is an aspirational date to legalize marijuana. It's not set in stone, but many people who smoke pot recreationally hope they'll be celebrating more than just Canada Day on that date next year. Today, I spoke with one of those people. Gideon Barker is a marijuana enthusiast. I asked him about the challenges of legalization and what he thinks about the province's role. This is certainly a complicated issue to figure out for the federal government and uh, for the provinces because we now know a lot of the responsibility and decision making is going to fall to the provinces. What do you think about that? Uh, well, it could be good or bad. Um, provinces vary greatly. Uh, Newfoundland is a prime example of that. We have very unique uh, tendencies, very unique things that need to happen here, being that uh, Newfoundland itself is an island, um, but we're also in a very bad financial state. So this could be something that could really turn us around economically if it's done properly. Uh, if legislation comes down and they're able to actually work with it, um, preferably they get a plan uh, set in stone before the actual date of legislation comes down so we can just roll through and have it be much smoother than it's, uh, it's most likely going to be. So. And the province will have to figure out how and where it will be sold. There's some talk about it maybe going into liquor stores or dispensaries. Uh, where do you think it should be sold? Uh, well, ideally, I think it should go through dispensaries. Um, it's a great opportunity for entrepreneurial spirit, uh, spirit to really come through. Um, there's a lot of potential business uh, to be had here. Um, I look at um, the province itself. Uh, you could potentially open up two massive producing facilities somewhere on the island that's actually producing marijuana where just uh, dispensaries are able to purchase it from. Um, uh, another just idea, but uh, I mean, uh, having dispensaries set up throughout the province, that's able to even out the economic um, uh, flow that's going to come in and all this money that's going to potentially be dumped in one spot could be more evenly dispersed throughout the island. Why not liquor stores? It seems like that would be a simple option. Um, it seems like it would be a simple option, but I'm, uh, the two substances are very different things. Um, and uh, even though you can regulate them in a very similar way, which I think you should, um, having them sold in the same place doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, there are two substances that are constantly told that you should never mix and shouldn't be mixed together. Why would you sell them together? It's kind of sending a really bad mixed message there. You can't buy tobacco in, in liquor stores, so it doesn't really make any sense why you'd buy, uh, be able to buy marijuana in liquor stores. 
What about the age limit? It, it appears that Ottawa is going to set the minimum at 18. What age do you think should be the limit for someone to legally smoke pot? Um, oh, well, uh, the age that you should is 25. Uh, it, it really shouldn't be uh, had by anybody on an under, uh, underdeveloped brain. That being said, legislating something and enforcing something at 25 is near impossible. So I think it was a smart move to put it at 18 because then you can move up from there. Um, I, I think personally it should be 21, but again, that's going to be a very hard time to actually legislate. It makes most sense to have it at 19 because that's the same age that you can um, uh, safely, or quote unquote, safely drink alcohol. Um, but I mean, uh, I, I would say personally, I would like to see it at 21. I just don't see it being a very realistic number. And the province is also going to be responsible for setting the price of marijuana. What should they keep in mind when they're going through that whole decision making process? The black market. Um, you have to keep in mind that uh, having marijuana uh, sold at a high rate isn't going to curb criminal activity. If people can get it cheaper from an illegal source, they're going to. Whereas something that is of the same price or just nominally higher, it's easier for people to just get it legally. One thing I found interesting is this whole idea that households will be allowed to grow four plants. What do you think of that? Uh, well, I, I think four is a very arbitrary number. Um, you can make alcohol in your own home. You know, I could brew beer or wine, um, and I don't have to get any license to do it. Uh, I can brew as much as I want, and nobody's going to be knocking on my door. So I'm curious where the four plants comes from, why that was a particularly needed number, and how they would possibly reinforce that. Um, does that mean that you're going to have to get some kind of licensing to be able to grow? And does that mean that you're sub uh, subject to being inspected? Again, all this is up in the air because we don't actually know. And one of the most difficult issues this whole process is facing is the idea of driving impaired. How, how do you test someone for marijuana impairment? How, how, should, how should government handle that? Uh, from what I'm aware of, they haven't handled it at all yet. Um, uh, n nothing that I'm aware of is uh, a roadside test available, which is crucial to this whole thing being available. Um, uh, impaired driving goes across the board, whether you're high on uh, pharmaceuticals, marijuana, alcohol, um, there has to be a way of testing it. Um, and right now there isn't a way. Um, what you have in place um, that I'm aware of for basic drug tests uh, are based on uh, hair follicles, blood, uh, and saliva, all of which take time to be able to process, and especially marijuana, aren't actually that accurate to tell you if you're high at the time. They tell you if you've smoked marijuana in the past. That means nothing if you're getting pulled over for being high. So uh, that's something that they definitely have to look at and need to get something that's accurate, tested, and proven to actually work. Well, the speech from the throne had some harsh words about the Muskrat Falls project. Hear more from the Lieutenant Governor coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A new group is calling for tougher regulation of the aquaculture industry. One of the founders of the group, Leo White, says they came together after the province released a Greek salmon farming proposal from further environmental assessment. Here now is Mark Quinn spoke with White. Here's part of their conversation. We felt if we don't have an environmental assessment process to participate in, what else can we do? So one thing we thought of was, well, we can challenge it in court, you know, which we're doing. And the other thing is to form a broad-based coalition uh, to try to hold government accountable, you know, for what's happening in the aquaculture industry. Do you recall what you thought when you first heard that the project had been released from an environmental assessment? Well, I was on Bell Island at the time, just traveling with my family, and it, it happened on a Friday afternoon around 5 o'clock. And when I heard it, you know, I pulled the car over and I listened, you know, to it. It was just a simple statement that it was released from further assessment. But the first thing that occurred to me, you know, is that this is the kind of bad message that comes out when something is released or something is a news release around 4.30 or 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. You know, obviously they don't want anybody to take notice of it. So it was a very bad message. And I was flabbergasted because I had no thought really that uh, this would be released uh, from further assessment. It, it really, under so many reasons, required to have a, an environmental impact statement. But yet the minister went ahead and released it. And now the government's thinking about buying a stake in this project. Uh, do you think it's possible for the government to regulate the industry and also own a stake in a, in a big player in the industry? Absolutely not. There's no way because it's a conflict of interest. You know, someone who's got a, a, 20, a $45 million stake in a project that makes them a 20%, a 25% shareholder. And then to be responsible for oversight and regulation of that project at the same time, it's impossible. You can't do it. It's a conflict of interest. And the government's still in the process of making that decision. What would you say to them? Well, I'd say very clearly to government that that's not the way they should be investing the province's money. You know, if the industry is going to come here, it should be sustainable. It should be able to uh, look after itself. Uh, it should not need uh, public money. I also understand that the industry is hoping to get additional money from ACOA. You know, so what would the Grieg company be putting into it? You know, uh, probably 50 percent uh, or maybe even less. You know, so why should the public be putting all of this money into an aquaculture industry that is supposed to be sustainable? And what do you say to people who, who might criticize the coalition as being anti-development and being only interested in protecting wild salmon and not thinking about jobs in industry in Newfoundland? Well, I'd say they're wrong because uh, we are saying, and you, you heard me say today, that we're not anti-aquaculture. Uh, we, we think jobs are important. Uh, if uh, the industry, for example, develops uh, in a closed containment, uh, which is an environmentally sustainable way, uh, on land or even in the ocean, as long as it's closed containment, uh, in my view, there would be more jobs associated with that, not less. Well, some high school students from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia are eager, eagerly counting down the days until the 100th anniversary memorial service at Vimy Ridge, France. They'll be there along with 10,000 other students. Shane Luck has that story. Originally, Dartmouth High School didn't intend to take a whole cafeteria's worth of students to Vimy Ridge. But when the planning started a year and a half ago, interest was so intense, the first spots were gobbled up in six minutes. Now, 83 students will be heading to Europe for the April 9th ceremony. They raised more than $30,000 for the trip. I'm super excited. Like, I've always wanted to go to Europe and do something like this, but the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of Vimy Ridge just makes it even cooler. Some of the students have a family connection to Vimy or to the military. My grandfather's brother came home and died of his wounds after. But um, I just, you know, my dad works on the base in Halifax too, so I mean, my whole family, it's kind of something that I've just been interested in my whole life. Each student has been assigned the name of a fallen soldier. They'll research his life and try to find his grave. Some students will also be searching for family graves, like Larissa Dusang, whose great uncle is one of 3,600 Canadians buried at Vimy. I think it will just make it like a lot more relatable just because um, like it's just so far away on the other side of the world. History teacher Robin Brown once worked as a guide at the Beaumont Hamill Monument. She hopes history will come alive for her students. So you can't help but kind of have that moment of where you're taken aback when you see a cemetery that's got five, six thousand graves in it. It's going to be really emotional I think. I'm going to pack some tissues but I think it's the kind of thing that I'll never forget. And all these students are aware many of the fallen soldiers were no older than they are now. 
I get to go over on a, an Airbus or a Boeing 737 in comfort. They left from Halifax, you know, some kids lied about their age on, you know, rackety old ships, got seasick, you know, took them six or seven days to get to France, and when they got there they were being shot at. We're very lucky to go in the fashion that we are. Shana Luck, CBC News, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Well, Ryan, everyone's talking about the storm. They're trying to figure out, you know, will events still go ahead Friday night? And the thing everyone wants to know is the numbers. How come you haven't given us any numbers about just how much snow we're going to get? Like, we pay you good money yeah. to come up with the numbers, and we got no numbers. It's a good question. And, uh, you know, depending on every, every system is different, uh, but it's, it's hard to throw out numbers and then scale them back again. Mm -hmm. And when we've been seeing the forecast model still not really coming into solid agreement on those numbers, and it is only Tuesday night. So that's one of the other big reasons I haven't thrown any numbers out yet is this thing really doesn't ramp up until the later parts of Thursday into Friday, continuing into Saturday. So it's a long duration event. Also kind of hard to nail down numbers over that long period of time and also the complicated setup on the Avalon where I do think we will see some ice pellets some freezing rain mixing in uh, so it is going to be a tricky setup not just a long setup where the forecast models have kind of yet to to come into agreement so that those are all kind of the reasons why holding off on another day before I really get into some of those hard numbers and tomorrow I do expect to have uh, some of those forecast numbers for you I will say this Areas in the significant snowfall region, which is the north coast of the island, central down the northeast coast of St. John's, looking pretty likely now. These areas are going to be seeing more than 15 to 20 centimeters of snowfall. And I will say this as well. The bullseye with this system is looking more and more likely to be from Bonavista Bay down towards St. John's. That's where I think we'll have the best chance of seeing the highest snowfall amounts again. Depending on the model you, see, you look at, uh, those highest amounts really vary. So that's why I don't want to really throw anything out just yet. Uh, another 24 hours or so. And I will say this as well. Strong winds looking very likely in these areas as well from that north coast towards the northeast and the Avalon Peninsula. So here's how things are playing out right now. The low, first low just coming off the northeast parts of the U.S. The second subtropical low, which is providing all the moisture. And that's the other reason I think the models are having a little bit of difficulty with this one is it's still so far to the south and kind of in an area where we're not getting much in the way of weather data uploading into the forecast models. And let's start things with your outlook here by at Thursday morning in terms of your timeline. So by, by Thursday morning, it's flurries and light snow across the island. As we move into the Thursday afternoon and evening time period, this is when I think we'll start to get into that mixing possibility for the Avalon Peninsula and Metro. Ice pellets, freezing rain, perhaps even some rain, not out of the question as we roll from Thursday night into Friday morning. The Bureau not out of the question to see some mixing here as well. But whoever does see mixing looks likely to go back to snow for Friday afternoon. So that's a complicated setup there as well. The timing of that uh, will be key because it looks like when we do go back to snow, it's going to be snow at times heavy. And Friday afternoon into Friday evening, looking pretty likely that most of the island, including the Avalon, is going to be seeing snow at times heavy. Central, the east and northeast in particular. And those winds really rifling in from the north. Gusts 80 to 100 plus from Thursday evening th uh, through overnight and pretty much through the day on Friday into Friday evening. And then finally the winds tapering off overnight and into Saturday. So a long wind event with this as well, not just the snow. And then finally this thing departs as we roll into the early stages of Saturday. So let's break down your forecast day by day here. There's a quick snapshot of tomorrow in case you missed it. Temperatures near the freezing mark in, La in uh, on the island, Labrador in the minus one to minus five range. For Thursday, again, that mixing in the southeast, that snow and Ramping up in central, light snow in the west with scattered flurries in eastern parts of Labrador. For Friday, again, it's a mix back to snow. If uh, depending on how far west that mixing line goes on the Avalon, snow and wind in central. And yes, light snow and breezy on the west coast. Labrador looking quiet with sun and cloud conditions from Friday and Saturday. Mainly cloudy in the west on, uh, on Saturday. That snow will taper to flurries for central and eastern Newfoundland as we move throughout the day on Saturday. It's only Tuesday. But guess what? I am watching yet another one on the long range menu Sunday and into Monday. That's the downfall of having a seven day forecast. Um, 
but we're keeping an eye on that. So if you do have travel plans late Sunday into Monday, stay tuned again for the island. Possibly more on the way. Well, today's young athlete of the day is 10 year old Annalise Sims from Coley's Point. Annalise is a swimmer with the Bay Roberts Sea Lions and enjoys her time in the water, especially when she's doing the front call. She loves to stay active and when she's not swimming, she's dancing, keeping busy with ballet and modern dance classes. Way to go. You're today's young athlete of the day. A Canadian naval ship played a huge role in a massive cocaine bust in international waters. The details coming up. Well, as we heard earlier in the show, the speech from the throne didn't lay out much in the way of new programs or directions from the government. But Peter, you were at the House of Assembly today for the throne speech. What stood out to you? Well, Carolyn, the best we really could hope for was some tone, laying out the case today about why more cuts are needed. And here's one part that stood out. As a province, we have had to come to terms with the unprecedented fiscal situation before us, and it has not been easy. We face the very real risk of losing the ability to borrow to pay for programs and service government provide. Innovative measures were required to make up for falling oil prices while we get government spending under control and diversify beyond oil. For over a decade, the province was operating without a plan for a sustainable future. That had to change. Through extensive consultation with the public and leaders from, business, from the business community, labor and arts, we drafted the way forward a vision for sustainability and growth in Newfoundland and Labrador. The vision of the way forward is this. Together, we will achieve a strong, diversified province with a high standard of living. The determination and drive of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will be supported by responsive, innovative, and efficient programs and services. Our government's vision is centered on three guiding principles. We will do better with less. We will collaborate and we will challenge ourselves. We will do better with less. There is a great opportunity to do better with less. While Newfoundland and Labrador's program costs are the highest per capita among problems, many of our outcomes, including health outcomes, rank among the lowest. Put simply, we are not seeing a sufficient return on investment. 
Further poor outcomes drive spending higher. It is incumbent on us as a government to be sure a healthy return on investment of taxpayers' dollars. Now, when you talk about the fiscal situation in the province, the other thing that comes to mind is Muskrat Falls. Okay, and what about all those cost overruns? How is government addressing that? Well, yeah, basically they're just reminding the public that this isn't their project and there's no chance of pulling the plug. Our government inherited Muskrat Falls, a legacy project for some, a tremendous financial burden for all of us. When we formed government, almost $4.5 billion had been spent and a total of $6.6 .6 billion in contracts had been signed. If we cancelled the project, we would still owe billions of dollars. If we cancelled the project, we would have to somehow provide the power promised to Nova Scotia or financial compensation in lieu. We are in too deep. Cancelling the project is not feasible and it would put more financial burden on the people of this province. Well, the U.S. Coast Guard announced a massive drug bust today in an operation that involved the Canadian Navy. Not just offloading the drug that the James seized, but also from several other Coast Guard cutters, including a Canadian warship, the Saskatoon. Altogether, the forces seized more than 14 metric tons of cocaine, which has a value of 560 million Canadian dollars. It happened in international waters off South and Central America in a series of raids that lasted about a month. The crew of the HMCS Saskatoon carried out one of the interceptions on March 12th and apprehended three suspected smugglers. A powerful storm described by officials as a monster continues to pound northeast Australia. This was the view from space as Cyclone Debbie roared ashore in Queensland overnight. The Category 4 system packed winds of 260 kilometers an hour, as well as heavy rainfall up to 500 millimeters. It led to widespread power outages and flooding. There's been at least one death, a woman involved in a car accident. The cyclone has lost some of its power since making landfall. I love you, Papa. Aw, <laughs> look at that. It's a love story for the ages. This is Raina, and she thought that this discarded water heater was a robot and instantly fell in love. Unfortunately, the water heater did not return her love. It just wasn't in its programming. Well, the good news is when the robot overlords come, she will be part of our welcoming party. <laughs> we'll be right back. Oh my goodness, that's so cute.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Peter Mansbridge has interviewed many illustrious newsmakers throughout his career. Prime ministers, presidents, and even a celebrity or two. Yes, but tonight on This Hour Has 22 Minutes, he faces perhaps his toughest interview to date. Here's a preview of tonight's show. Welcome to Mansbridge One-on-One -on -One from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to interview some of the most famous and controversial people alive. But one guest has eluded me. Until now, please welcome perhaps my favorite guest, me, Peter Mansbridge. <laughs> Why do we touch our chin so much? Well, it keeps the head up. Mm, you know, some of those interviews off. are, you know, I say you can doze off. You were offered a job at CBS in the States as an anchor. You turned it down to stay in Canada. Big yeah, mistake. Big mistake, yeah. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> Idiot. You've Don't... interviewed a lot of famous people mm -hmm. over the years. And I, I want to put you on the hot seat. I want to ask you some of the questions that you've asked them. What does it feel like to be Anne Murray? <laughs> as a woman, what does the earth look like from space? I didn't ask that. Oh, this looks like a good episode. <laughs> well, uh, he's the Taekwondo champ who cannot be blocked. Yeah, this is 16-year-old martial arts ace from Bosnia smashing 111 concrete blocks using just his head. And it took him 35 seconds. Oh, my goodness. It's a Guinness, a new Guinness World Record, but, uh, oh, my goodness. Oh. Ouch. Yeah. I'm going to have a headache after that for sure. I, I feel like his sponsor might, be, might as well be Advil, you know, like. Oh. Whew. Oh. At the end of the seven day, I may feel like doing that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, after the next seven days. Uh, yeah, wow. Uh, impressive. Uh, okay, tomorrow temperatures again along that northeast coast and the Atlantic coastline from St. John's up towards St. Anthony in that zero to minus one range, cooling off into Labrador where we'll see more clouds than not. And across the island, we're going to be hovering around the freezing mark with a better chance of seeing some sunshine in the mix. Uh, somewhere in here, I've got my viewer picture of the day, and there it is. Some Aww, visitors nice. in Battle Harbor. James Jones. Now, of course, furry and fluffy from a distance, but uh, not yeah. so much up close. So uh, hopefully they only stayed for a short while and then uh, got out of town. A lovely picture all the same. Yes, definitely. Mm. Well, thank you very much, James Jones, for that. And that wraps up this episode of Here and Now Tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good night. Good night.